Welcome to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with author, speaker, coach, and mentor, Sandra Younger. She is an acclaimed author, international speaker, and certified professional coach dedicated to encouraging resilience and potential. Her 2013 book, The Fire Outside My Window, A Survivor Tells the True Story of California's Epic Cedar Fire is now available as an updated 20th anniversary edition. Her powerful story of California's first modern megafire has been hailed as required reading for residents of wildfire country and adopted as a training resource for top-level emergency professionals. Read reviews often say they couldn't put it down, and this is the kind of interview that we have. Enjoy this interview. Well, hey, it's great to meet you, and I'm looking forward to getting into your life as an author and a speaker and a coach and a mentor, but before that, you know, mm-hmm. we're coming up on March, which was four years ago, the beginning of this pandemic. And I'm curious, how did you make it through the pandemic and how did it change you? Are we being recorded yet? Oh, yeah, that was my, yeah, I come from jazz radio, so I tend to jump right in. But, yeah, okay. I can start at the top again if you want. Okay. All right. Let's do that then. Okay, cool. Sandra, it's great to meet you. Thank you so much for taking a minute out to the program. And I want to begin our conversation before we get into your life as a, as a coach and a mentor and a speaker and an author, how did you survive the pandemic? How did you get through the last, you know, four years or so, and how did it change you? Well, I think we were lucky, Joe. Um, my husband and I are both um, at retirement age, although I haven't retired, <laughs> but it gave us the freedom Um, not to have to worry about work, not to have to worry about lost income. So we live on the side of a mountain outside of San Diego, and um, we were pretty safe where we were. We were able to get things delivered to us and just figured it out, as everyone did, and felt really lucky because we had a beautiful place to hunker down for a year. The biggest impact on us was that we had recently become grandparents and all of a sudden we couldn't see these babies who had become such a delightful part of our lives. So that was the hardest part for us. We didn't see them for six months and uh, and then another six months. So um, yeah, we were fortunate. So let's get to the, the, the heart and soul of what you do for a living. There's a lot going on on paper. So if I put you in front of a bunch of third graders, it's career day, and one of the kids curiously looks up and says, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer that child? I would say, you know, the great thing about finding work that you love is that you can keep reinventing yourself. When you get bored, you can find something new to do because you're whole and creative and resourceful and smart. And I would say that I started out in journalism. I came into journalism sort of in the Woodward and Bernstein era where um, it was one of the, seemed to be one of the most direct ways to make a big difference in the world. And that was my career for Um, Many, many years, I later went back and got a degree in magazine journalism, so I was a magazine editor for a while. And then this big scary thing happened in my life when my husband and I woke up in the middle of the night and everything outside our windows was on fire. And we had to run for our lives and were able to escape And I knew as a journalist, as a storyteller, that it was my job now to tell that story so people would not forget what, in fact, has become a historic fire. So I went uh, ahead and wrote that book. And then when I wrote the book, I realized that people wanted to hear more about it. And they invited me to speak. And then they wanted to know what I had learned about coming back from this and I found myself coaching people, so I went out and got the professional training and credentials to coach at a professional level. And so that is how things have continued to unfold one step after another. So when you were in the third grade, was your dream to grow up and become a journalist? What was your dream? 
my dream in third grade was to become a veterinarian and save all the animals. That was my dream. Excellent. So how did this happen that, that you wanted to become a journalist? Talk to me about growing up and, and, and even how all of being an author and everything that you've turned into today, how did all these seeds get planted in you? Well, that's a long story, John, but I will try to condense it because, you know, as journalists, we're taught to cut for space and time. So <laughs> Shorthand, when, yep. Yeah. When I was growing up, I, I grew up in this sort of idyllic little town in North Carolina, and every weekend we would go visit my grandparents, and they had a farm. So they had all of these animals at the farm, not just dogs and cats, but chickens and cows and an old draft horse and I was just in heaven with all the animals. So I decided I wanted to be a veterinarian and, um, you know, and work with animals. And I started out my college career at North Carolina State University as a biology major. But in those days, there was not a real path um, for various professions. It was, it was sort of left up to you to find your way. You take the, the courses, you get the degree, you apply to school. There were no internship programs. There, there were, were no pre-vet clubs, any of that, which I know they have now because guess what? One of my daughters is a veterinarian. So I was able to pass that, um, that dream down the line. So um, I got to organic chemistry in my science studies, and I thought, do I really want to be memorizing like thousands of different reactions and I, I just I I don't know I was I was kind of daunted by that and I at the same time was was really uh, mentored by my English teacher who told me Sandra you you write like Flannery O'Connor of course one of the great southern writers and I decided maybe instead of studying all this minutia I can just write about nature. And and as I mentioned already, at that point, we were finding out about um, Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein, the, the um, Washington Post reporters, young, not that much older than we college kids were at that time, uh, uncovered this, this great scandal that went all the way to the White House and um, seemingly saved the day. So that was influential to me and I started writing for my college newspaper and really loved just being able to ask people questions. I expect it's part of the reason you do these podcasts, Joe, because it's just so fun to ask people questions, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They gave me this little shred of paper that passed for a student press pass and um, I was in Raleigh. I was in the state capitol. I could go to the legislature. I could talk to the, the chancellor of the university system. You know, it was it was wonderful to get in and and just be on the inside of everything. So I decided I would formally become a journalism major, which meant much to my father's chagrin because he was a, a, a state graduate. Um, I had to switch to. Um, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where the journalism school was, which to anyone who's ever been to state is considered a great defection. But anyway, that's what I did. I went there. That's where I met my husband. And um, that's how it all started. So who's been a hero for you in your life? Oh, my gosh. Wow. You know, early on, my hero was uh, Queen Elizabeth I. I had um, I had one of those ancient lifetime um, books about a full color books with all the the paintings of her and her regalia, and she was a powerful woman in uh, a pivotal time in history. And I really looked up to her. Um, I would say Flannery O'Connor again was a hero when my English teacher mentioned that, I looked her up and I read some of her things. And to this day, she's a, um, she's a role model for me in writing. If I could only write as, um, as pithily, as humorously, as uh, deeply as Flannery O'Connor 
at her best. I know she's um, in in today's light. There are a few things about her that people have uncovered that don't look quite so savory. But as a writer, she she certainly has been a hero to me. Those are two. So, yeah, no, that's great. No, that's perfect. And I'm curious. If you could have a dream interview right now, you could really reignite that journalism um, vibe. Who would you love to interview? Who would who would anybody on earth right now? Who would you oh love to gosh. interview? Oh. Um, I think I'd like to. I think I'd like to um, interview Zelensky, Vladimir Zelensky. Yeah. Um, he he pretty much looks like a hero at this point. We'll see how things work out. Uh, but um, for someone who came from a show business background, essentially, he stepped up and he fascinates me. Um, Taylor Swift fascinates me. How did she get to this point where she's the most famous woman in the world um, that's, that's amazing. I, you know, how did that happen? And how has she managed to keep um, some semblance of, of personal life and, and personal convictions? So, yeah, those are fascinating. I have had a chance to interview a lot of fascinating people, so that was fun. Well, let's, let's go down that route. What was one of the most surprising fascinating interviews with somebody that you were a little upset that your time ran out and you had to move on? Oh, um, do you remember Happy Days, the, the TV show oh, Happy yeah. Days? Of course, okay. yeah. I got to interview Mrs. C. I got to interview cool. Marion Ross. Um, this was like 20 years ago, and she was delightful. I also got to interview... Art Linkletter, and he was, I mean, people today don't even know who he was. He was, I say, he was like the Ryan Seacrest of of the 50s and 60s. You know, he did everything. He did radio. He did television. He had one of the longest-running daytime TV shows called Linkletter's House Party. He was the one who pioneered that um, that show called um, The Kids, Kids Say the Darndest Thing, he was really fun, and he was in his 90s when I interviewed him, so I would have loved to have more time with him. Um, I interviewed Tony Gwynn, great baseball player. He was, he was great to interview um, in the Hall of Fame now. He was uh, Mr. Padre for a long time. Speaking of teams, that's been a lot of years under the clouds. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And the other one that comes to mind is Jim Senegal. Jim Senegal was one of the founders of Costco. And you know you have a really uh, a really great human being when you ask, what do you consider your greatest success in life? And he answers, my family. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And Tony Gwynn, mm-hmm. you know, being a baseball fan, I don't think people understand how good he was. He was so great. Yeah, he was so great. And, well, they don't understand so much because he spent his whole life with the Padres. So, um, you know, he he was here in San Diego. He was known as Mr. Padres, Mr. San Diego, and we lost him way too soon. But he was, um, he was a great in many ways. Yeah, he was he was amazing for sure. And I, yeah, and just not being on a winning team, that always kind of, uh, drag well, things down. So. And he played right field, which is not the sexiest position, you know, but um, he inspired a lot of kids, including my daughter, who played um, softball as a kid and in high school. And she said, you know, they put me in right field, and I thought, Tony Gwynn played in right field. And I was able to tell him that. He was he was tickled. That's, that's great. So let me ask you this. At this point in your life, what is the motivation for you every day to wake up and to evolve and to bite and to do all these things that make you who you are? 
the older I get, and um, I'll be 71 next month, which is surreal, but the older I get, of course, the more you focus on um, what do I really want to do before I leave this planet? And I think a lot about something that St. Francis of Assisi said on his deathbed. He said, I have done what was mine to do. And I pray that you all will do what is yours to do. You will find and do what is yours to do. And so every day I want to do what's mine to do. And I want to live in gratitude because life is amazing. Every moment is a miracle. And we sort of sleepwalk through that. We're so in our heads about regrets from the past or fears about the future. And I get that. I totally get that. And I spent a lot of time there myself. So I have to remind myself, what's great about this moment? You know, what's, what's gone well? What am I thankful for? And this is something I, I talk about when I speak now. And um, I speak about resilience and potential and possibility if we focus on that, what could be possible instead of always focusing on the negative, which, you know, as as a journalist, it pains me to say, the media just continues to feed us. Um, so that's what, that's what excites me is, you know, what's possible today? What is still mine to do? And when I do tap into that, that's where the fulfillment comes from. I'm really lucky that I don't have to work a job I hate anymore just for the money. I'm really, really lucky about that. Um, that was not always the case. But yeah. that, that's the, that's the um, secret for me is living in gratitude and focusing on what's mine to do and letting other people do what theirs to do, not feeling responsible for the whole world. So of all of the things that you've done professionally up to this point, what are you the proudest of? I think I'm proudest of, of my book, The Fire Outside My Window. I just released it in October as a new edition, a 20th anniversary edition, because it's been 20 years since that fire that changed my life. I'm proud of it because I, I did finally write a book I never had the attention span to do a whole book before, um, and I was doing articles as a journalist instead. And because it's become an important book for firefighters, for people who lived in high-risk areas, it, um, it does tell our story about finding the key to resilience and how you come back after losing everything. We lost our house. We lost 12 neighbors. We drove out through fire. We almost lost our lives. And that, that leaves a mark on you. So I was able to, to capture that, to tell the stories of the people we lost so they won't be forgotten, um, to write a great adventure story, really a thriller story that readers say they can't put down. And best of all, Joe, I have heard stories about how this book has actually saved people's lives because they read my story and they knew from that how fast and how bad these wildfires can be and they were able to evacuate in time to save their lives or call um, a loved one and tell them, leave now. So that and the fact that the book has been a great encouragement to people, it's used now in leadership training for emergency managers and firefighters. I mean, it's, it's, done, it's done so much beyond what I imagined. And um, I hope more people read it because it is a story of, of hope and resilience and reinventing yourself. So at the end of the day, Sandra, everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, all of your readers, colleagues, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? <laughs> Where did you get these questions, Joe? My gosh. I thought them all. Uh, I thought them all up. <laughs> well, good for you, because they're tough ones. Um, <laughs> that's what they tell us in coaching. You know you've asked a good question when somebody says, that's a good question. 
So who, how do I see myself? I see myself as someone who's blessed beyond measure um, by family and friends and um, good health and ability to make a difference in the world. And I see myself as someone who has grown a lot and is still growing and really wants to contribute and make a difference in the world still. Great answer. So if anyone wants to purchase the book, reach out, learn more about you, anything in your world, where can they go? They can go to my website, which is just my name, SandraYounger.com, S-A-N-D-R-A-Y-O-U-N-G-E-R.com. They can scroll down and find uh, links to purchase the book. And also, there's a free gift there called The Comeback Formula, a resilience building guidebook. They can download that, and it has my five top practices proven to build personal resilience. And that is the skill that enables us to turn any disaster into an opportunity. This has been so inspirational. You've overcome so much. What a great story. Sandra, thank you for your time, and best of luck with everything. I appreciate it. Joe, thank you, and good luck in the Super Bowl. Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, business, spirituality, music, and more from around the globe. Our esteemed theme music was composed and produced by the great E.E. E. Pointer of Kansas City's River Cow Orchestra. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.